Right now on Morning News Now, renewed calls for a ceasefire in Gaza after another Israeli airstrike on a packed refugee camp, the second in just two days. Well, on the border, the first wave of civilians crossing the Rafah border into Egypt, several of them Americans. We'll see more of this process going on in the coming days. We're working nonstop to get Americans out of Gaza as soon and as safely as possible. All this as loved ones hold out hope for the 200 plus hostages still held captive by Hamas. We have team coverage. Also this morning, Donald Trump Jr. back in court in the civil fraud case against the Trump Organization. The eldest son of the former president denying his involvement in preparing his father's financial statements. More from his first day of testimony as his brother Eric prepares to take the stand. Plus, infant mortality rates on the rise in America. We'll explore what's behind the largest spike in two decades, plus what the statistics reveal about disparities in race. And the Texas Rangers waking up as champions after winning the World Series for the first time ever. More on the thrilling Game 5 win ending a six-decade drought. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off this morning. We begin this hour in Gaza, where Israel is stepping up its aerial and ground assault on the sealed-off Palestinian territory. Yesterday, Israeli warplanes bombed the Jabalia refugee camp for a second straight day, drawing widespread combination from aid and rights groups. Officials inside Gaza say at least 195 people were killed in both attacks. Well, the Israeli, Israeli military says it targeted and killed Hamas commanders. Today, more foreign nationals are critically injured and critically injured Palestinians are expected to leave Gaza through the Rafah border crossing with Egypt. The limited evacuation began on Wednesday and is set to continue for the next few weeks. Speaking in Minnesota yesterday, President Biden said he does believe there should be a pause in order to get hostages out of Gaza. He said the U.S. was working nonstop to try and get Americans out and and to support humanitarian efforts in the besieged strip. The United States is going to continue to drive humanitarian support for innocent people in Gaza who need help, and they do need help. We're going to continue to affirm that Israel has the right to resp and responsibility to defend its citizens from terror, and it needs to do so in a manner that is consistent with international and humanitarian law that prioritizes the protection of citizens. In a few moments, we will speak with the president of the U.S. Middle East Project and former Israeli negotiator of the Oslo Accords, Daniel Levy. But let's begin with the latest on the ground and our correspondent, Jay Gray, who is near the Gaza border. Jay, first of all, what's happening where you are right now? Yeah. Yeah, and Joe, we've just seen a series of what are firefights. You've got the Israeli Defense Forces trying to push Hamas back from the border, just about two miles or so behind us here. A lot of explosions, a couple of flares in the air, so they are actively working in this area again to make a defensive front and continue to push inward toward Gaza. Jay, we know Israel again bombed the Jabalia refugee camp yesterday. Walk us through we know yeah. about that and some of the reaction we're hearing. Well, the IDF continues to say that they are targeting what are Hamas leadership and operational headquarters and some of them buried, they say, in areas where uh, civilians are. They say that that is a tactic of Hamas and something uh, that they continue to try and root out. The response, though, overall and globally continues to climb. There, there continues to be an echo uh, of problems with the number of civilians that appear to be injured as a result of these attacks. Let's listen to what one human rights organization had to say. We are very concerned about settler violence in the West Bank. We find it incredibly destabilizing. We find it counterproductive to Israel's long-term security, uh, in addition to, of course, being extremely harmful to the Palestinians living in the West Bank. Um, and we have sent a very clear message to them that it's unacceptable, it needs to stop, and those responsible for it need to be held accountable. Yeah, and look, it's just another example of how this seems to be spreading across the region, Joe. There, there continue to be flare-ups in and around that area as well. So it's a, it's a very serious situation, one that's getting much worse. Jay, let's talk about what's happening at another border, the border with Egypt and that limited evacuation out of Gaza yeah. through the Rafah crossing. It continues today. How many people are expected to leave and is humanitarian aid getting in? 
Yeah, it's been a big change at the Rafah border with Egypt, and we have seen more humanitarian aid rolling in. Yesterday was the biggest day yet for the number of trucks that made their way through with uh, medicine, water, and food, desperately needed items there in Gaza. But we're seeing people for the first time go the other way, including Americans. One of the estimates right now is that about 7,000 foreign nationals are prepared to cross at Rafa and into Egypt and then on to their uh, countries. We know that there were a handful of Americans yesterday, hundreds more expected to cross today. And this is something that's been going on since this war began, the negotiations back and forth, Israel, Egypt, Hamas involved, and of course, Qatar is the middleman in all of this. And finally, facilitating that yesterday. And as we are the president, as, as he mentioned at the beginning of all of this, we expect this to continue for the next couple of days, Joe. And a moment ago, we heard from Secre Secretary of State spokesman Matthew Miller talking about violence in the occupied West Bank. The U.N. says it was already the deadliest year for Palestinians in 15 years with around 200 killed. Since October 7th, they say 121 have been killed. Real quickly, talk to us about the situation there and concerns from the international community. Yeah, there's no question that it is becoming more and more uh, violent and volatile in the West Bank. There continue to be uh, age groups that are focused on that area, but it's difficult because of the violence, obviously. And so it's something that they continue to watch closely and, and continue to have very real concern about. We know that there's a, a very strong divide in that area. And so it's, it's uh, become very problematic. And as you described, uh, very deadly over the last couple of weeks. All right. Jay Gray reports reporting from the border near Gaza. Please continue to stay safe. Let's bring in Daniel Levy. He is the president of the U.S. Middle East Project, a group that works to bring about a lasting Israeli-Palestinian peace. He was an advisor to former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Thank you for joining us, Daniel. On October 14th, you co-wrote a piece for the Irish Times. The headline was, The Outside World Must Walk Israel Back from the Abyss. It Cannot Be Part of the Choir of Incitement. In the article, you say, quote, If the international community does not intervene to stop what is coming, we could be watching a combination of mass killing and forced expulsion in real time. Fast forward to today. What's your assessment of what's happening right now? Is what you wrote about a couple weeks ago, do you fear it's playing out now? And is the international community doing enough right now? Unfortunately, what myself and my co-author Zaha Hassan discussed there, <laughs> Well, with the images are on the screen, you can see for yourselves, that is what's playing out. I think half of the Palestinian population of 2.3 million in Gaza approximately are displaced. They're displaced still within the Gaza Strip at this stage. The, what happened on October 7th was, was horrendous. What has happened subsequently in the way Israel has, has gone about this military operation uh, in Gaza and the Palestinian civilian casualties are something that really should shake us and needs to be stopped and needs to be stopped now. And I would say that what this is doing in terms of the anger this is generating through generations, and by the way, not just of Palestinians, is something that is absolutely antithetical to Israel's long-term security. We're talking numbers of dead Palestinian children that it is hard to wrap one's head around. Uh, six, seven times the number of children killed in Ukraine in 20 months. That's the magnitude of this. And so, no, the short answer is the efforts to end this, the efforts to bring this in to uh, uh, dimensions that are actually about security. But most important now, the efforts to bring a ceasefire are inadequate, I hope that what is going on in private looks very different to what is being said in public. And maybe, maybe I'm allowing myself some optimism that, that President Biden, uh, in a, a almost slip of the tongue yesterday, is, is speaking to a, a, a more serious effort. Daniel, we know you were part of the Israeli negotiating team behind the Oslo Accords. Many see that agreement as really one of the closest moments we came to peace in the region. What would it take to get back to that? Is it even possible? It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I don't think we can go back to it. It was, a, it was almost a quarter century ago where, where we came possibly close. 
Uh, I'd like to think so. It wouldn't have been a perfect piece. Many people would have said that there were issues not dealt with. Now, this has been such a shock to the system, such a disruptive event, that the last thing we should want to do is go back to October 6th. Sure, I wish we could have all those lives back, but on October 6th, what we were doing was ignoring the fact that millions of Palestinians were living without their basic rights and freedoms, and this was a pressure cooker, and it exploded. And we can't put it back in the pressure cooker. The first thing to do is to humanize each other again, and the second thing to do is to get to the root causes, make sure that Palestinians have their rights, have their freedoms, and living in equality and dignity, because that's the path not just to Palestinian security, but to Israeli security. You can't defeat an oppressed people militarily. We need a political solution, and it's well past time to push for one. Daniel Levy from the U.S. Middle East Project. Thank you for your time this morning. We do appreciate it. On Capitol Hill, the Democratic-led Senate passed several bills with bipartisan support aiming to prevent a government shutdown ahead of the November 17th deadline. That deadline's fast approaching. It's two weeks from tomorrow. The Senate overwhelmingly passed those funding bills yesterday by a vote of 82 to 15. Meanwhile, the Republican-controlled House, led by new Speaker Mike Johnson, also passed spending bills. But they're looking to cut spending and break off aid to Israel, passing that as a separate measure. Senate's Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, a Democrat, says such partisan efforts will go nowhere. The House GOP proposal is not going anywhere. It's, 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 gonna, it's dead before it even is voted on. The Speaker should start over, this time without terrible partisan poison bills, this time sitting down with Democrats and working this issue through. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us now with more. So, Julie, what are going to be the challenges on Capitol Hill with the government shutdown now just over two weeks away? Just how far apart are the Senate and the House? Uh, extremely far apart. You heard Majority Leader Schumer on the floor there. He was talking about the Israel bill only. And the reason he was calling it partisan is because House Speaker Mike Johnson tied uh, cutting, spending cuts to the IRS uh, in order to pay for the Israel bill. Now, the White House said that was a non-starter. Schumer, you heard him there saying it's dead before it was even voted on in the House. That vote still expected to happen this week. But that bill, like so many others, going nowhere in the Senate. And then you have the overall pro overall problem of government funding, uh, which is just around the corner in two weeks. It's more than certain that it is uh, going to need a short-term government funding measure. Speaker Johnson said as much yesterday in the Senate Republican lunch. But Majority Leader Schumer also touching on another subject that the Senate took up later in the night. Take a listen to this. We absolutely must ensure that our military is fully staffed and fully equipped to defend the American people. And it begins by confirming these vital nominations that are currently on hold. Every day that Senator Tuberville continues his blanket holds, our military preparedness is degraded. A long night in the Senate last night. Tuberville's Republican colleagues actually tried to force votes on those nominees. Remember, he's been holding up for nine months now hundreds of military promotions, which, of course, are vital to national security, especially when you have those two dueling wars going on overseas. Yeah, some strong words from his fellow Republicans yesterday. Uh, let's talk about something else happening in the House. Embattled New York Congressman George Santos, he survived an expulsion vote with some Democrats even voting against expulsion. So where do things stand now with Santos? Yeah, a dramatic night in the Senate, also a dramatic night in the House. Santos sitting in the back of the chamber spared this time around 179 only, far less than the simple majority needed uh, to expel him, voted actually, uh, excuse me, two-thirds majority needed to expel him, but 179, far less than even the simple majority, uh, voted against expelling Santos, with the majority of Republicans actually voting to keep him around in the House. That might have something to do with that very narrow margin that they're working with, uh, or it might have to do with the fact that the House Ethics Committee that is also probing Santos, in addition to his federal charges that he's facing, said, hold on a second, we'll be ready with our report and our findings potentially in two weeks. We heard from the House Speaker Mike Johnson last week, who said that it's not time to expel Santos until and unless he's been indicted or they have findings from the Ethics Committee. Perhaps when that comes down, Santos will have another go, potentially, at expelling him. But so far, he's safe. All right, Julie Sirk, another busy week on Capitol Hill. Thank you so much. 
Donald Trump Jr. will be back in a New York courtroom today for more testimony. He'll take the stand again in that $250 million civil fraud trial against the former president's family and their company. Yesterday, he faced questions about his involvement with financial documents that the New York Attorney General's office says were purposely inflated to benefit the company. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has more on his day in court. The former president's eldest son inside a Manhattan courtroom. Donald Trump Jr., the first of his siblings to testify in a $250 million civil fraud lawsuit against the family's real estate business. New York's attorney general accusing the Republican frontrunner, his sons, and his company of inflating assets to get better terms on loans and insurance, pointing to Don Jr.'s signature on documents certifying the accuracy of the company's financial statements, which include assets like Mr. Trump's apartment in Manhattan, listed as 30,000 square feet, when it's actually a third of that size. He was pressed by the state about his role as executive vice president of the Trump organization. Don Jr. saying he relied on outside accountants who prepared the financial statements. He's blasted the suit from the Democratic attorney general and the judge, also a Democrat, as a partisan kangaroo court. It doesn't matter what general practices in business would be. It doesn't matter. They have a narrative. They have an end goal. And they'll do whatever it takes to get there. The judge has already ruled in the state's favor on the central fraud claim. Much of the trial is to determine what, if any, punishment should be handed down. Meanwhile, the former president has said he's done nothing wrong and again slamming the judge, posting, quote, leave my children alone. Our thanks to Laura Jarrett for that report. There is some other Trump legal news in his classified documents trial. That's a federal case out of Florida. The judge there signaled she may push the trial date. The case currently set to begin in May of next year, but the judge noted Trump also faces a separate trial in March. That's for the election interference case in Washington. Civil rights attorney and former prosecutor Kristen Gibbons Fedden joins us now with more on this New York civil case. So Kristen, Don Jr., he basically argued, well, his name was on those financial statements and there's seems to be language suggesting he was responsible in part for them. He left things up to the accountant. So is that going to fly? What else stood out in Don Jr.'s testimony? Well, you know, his testimony did not really present any significant surprises. It really did meet all of my expectations. You know, with him being the first member of the family to really testify, he maintained that stance that you just said, where he blindly trusted the money experts. And that's the narrative that they consistently have held, really deflecting responsibility for this alleged fraudulent asset inflation to external accountants. But this really underlines their tactical move, which is aimed at undermining the prosecution's efforts efforts to really establish that element of intent for the intentional fraud, because they're basically saying that they adhered to all the business or standard business practices and financial reporting protocols. But this stance really does, does, not, does not only face scrutiny against the judge's prior rulings, as you, as you talked about before in this segment, um, that the defendants did, in fact, fraudulently overvalue these assets. But keep in mind, you know, after Trump won that presidency, his sons, Donald and Eric, really kind of propelled to high roles within the organization. Donald Jr. was a trustee, while Eric Trump really ran over the daily control of the family business. Um, so his testimony also illuminated the managerial cap capacities of both of them. And really, the prosecution is going to be able to utilize that to argue liability, really emphasizing their inherent duty of oversight, which is really going to bolster their claims to be able to show that intention, intentionality behind the fraud. So, Chris, we have to remember this is a case where the judge is the jury and the judge has already fined the former president for breaching a gag order. How big of a deal is the family's testimony in this case? What is at stake? right now. You know, it's it's a big deal. Um, and, and what is at stake really is money, money, money. The stakes are really high here. You know, the defense really needs to, to it needs that consistent narrative, which really, like you mentioned, begins with Donald Trump's testimony. But again, there's no guarantee that that narrative is going to hold up really throughout the case because the penalties really, as Laura had talked about in that segment, um, deal with the valuation, how much of that fraud because of the prior findings. They could potentially face a $250 million financial judgment with significant operational restrictions. So not only paying that amount, but then the dissolution of their ability to practice business 
in the state of New York could also affect their future um, abilities to make money and profit as well. Quick, quickly, Kristen, this is a civil trial. It's not a criminal trial. So, so what does that mean as far as what rights Trump's children have when they're testifying? Well, they're going to have the same rights as any standard defendant. Keep in mind, Don Jr. And, and Eric are active defendants, while Ivanka, she was dismissed from the defendant list because, you know, her crime or her um, the allegations of fraud were too remote and they surpassed the statute of limitations. So her counsel is still trying to fight whether or not she's going to have to testify. So we may not hear from her. But with regard to Donald Jr. and Eric, they could absolutely opt to plead the fifth, which would um, avoid any testimony that could incriminate them for any future charges. But as you heard from the testimony, and it's continuing, and we expect Eric to testify, he's also been deposed. They have chosen to defend themselves, exercising their really constitutional rights to do so. All right, Kristen Gibbons, right, Fedden, as always, appreciate your expertise. Thank you so much. It is only November 2nd, yet it feels very much like winter in New York. And yes, more cold temps are headed for the east. So let's check your morning news now weather forecast with meteorologist Angie Lastman. I believe this morning that Mariah Carey has now been re-encased <laughs> in ice because she stepped outside. I think you are exactly correct, Joe. Yeah, and temperatures this morning in New York and up and down the east coast and mostly the eastern half of the country are quite chilly into the 30s, into the 20s for some. And even this afternoon, we're going to see that cold continuing. One note, we do have that flood risk remaining across the Pacific Northwest today because that atmospheric river is going to continue to dump heavy amounts of rain for folks there. But let's focus on the cold because more alerts, no surprise here, the frost and freeze alerts are up for 66 million people. This includes parts of the Southern Plains stretching up into the Mid-Atlantic, Washington, D.C., Augusta, Montgomery, all the way out to Lufkin, Texas are included in this. Uh, and temperatures still ranging in the 20s to 30s with the potential for some record lows to be broken this morning. We'll have to wait and see once the morning is over exactly what record lows uh, clock in. But either way, it is uh, an extra layers kind of morning in places like Nashville, 29 degrees right now, 27 in Cincinnati, 34 degrees in Washington, D.C., uh, and Montgomery sitting into the upper 20s. Atlanta at 36. By this afternoon, you'll slightly warm up back into the 50s, but uh, quite cool for this time of year either way. Pittsburgh ends up at 46 for your high this afternoon, and New York just ends up at 50 degrees. Now, tomorrow, we'll start that kind of great gradual warming trend along the east coast it'll still be a little chilly into the afternoon hours but notice places like oklahoma city kansas city back to normal with denver running warmer than normal for this time of year and here's where the good stuff happens if you're looking for some of that warmer air you're not quite ready to jump into winter just yet at richmond you'll end up into the upper 60s on saturday and low 70s by sunday but back to the mid 70s on monday so uh, the weather can't decide what it wants to do <laughs> new york will sit into the low 60s through the weekend and into early next week but here's the really good stuff because guess what the streak will be broken this this weekend when it comes yes. to rain across the northeast it'll be cool and crisp for tomorrow and we'll still see those showers across the pacific northwest um, but look out sat look at saturday a dry weekend ahead a gem of a day across the south we'll see plenty of sunshine really the problematic area even through the weekend is going to be that uh, pacific storm that brings more rain and the flooding concern and even some mountain snow to folks in the rockies my umbrella won't know what to do <laughs> it's gonna be so bored <laughs> it's so bored All right. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Turning now to some sad news for college basketball fans. Hall of Fame coach Bob Knight has died at the age of 83. Knight rose to fame while winning three national championship titles for Indiana University. His 1976 championship squad remains the last men's team to finish a season undefeated. This time his coach was not without controversy. Knight was accused of physically abusing several of his players and was fired from his coaching position after a run-in with a student on campus. Knight's family did not release an immediate cause of death. Some good news, sports, good sports news this morning. The Texas Rangers are on top of the baseball world for the first time ever. The Rangers handily defeated the Arizona Diamondbacks in last night's Game 5 of the World Series, winning their first ever championship. Going into this season, Texas was one of just six teams to have never won the Fall Classic. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joined us now from outside Globe Life Field in Arlington with more on the champion Rangers. Morgan, good morning. So let's talk about Game 5, which was not where you were. They were on the road in Phoenix, but how was Texas able to pull off really this memorable and somewhat dominant postseason run? 
Uh, yeah, Joe, really, the, the one word on everyone's minds this morning, finally. They finally did it. It finally happened. The Rangers finally pulled it off. Uh, so much excitement here. They pulled it off, really, behind an incredible performance uh, by their, their pitching staff, Joe. Particularly Game 5, they go in. It's 0-0 until the seventh inning. That is where their all-star Corey Seager was able to get the ball rolling for the Rangers, and he was able to bring, uh, he was able to score in the seventh to give a a small lead over the Diamondbacks, but they uh, padded that in the ninth inning, Joe. Uh, we had uh, their other star, Simeon, hit a two-run homer to go up 5-0, and they shut it down from there. And I have to tell you that the anticipation going into uh, the ninth inning was incredible because back in 2011, the Rangers were one strike, one out away from clinching another World Series that slipped through their fingers to the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, who ended up winning a game six and then a game seven. So they'd been close before, uh, but last night they were finally able to close it out. So, here's the thing, Morgan. It was just two years ago when the Rangers lost more than 100 games in a season. If you're not a baseball fan, that's just really bad. So how did they turn around their fortune so quickly? <laughs> Yeah, less than ideal, uh, for sure. No, they, they brought some new talent onto their roster, and they had a steady hand of managing them as well, Joe, and that kind of gave them the, the leadership they needed uh, to make a serious postseason run after the game. You heard multiple players say their mentality going into the postseason was attack, 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 uh, and, and they absolutely did. Uh, winning in five games, not wanting to chance a game six or a game seven uh, against the Diamondbacks that uh, also had a, a strong postseason presence as well. Real yep. quickly, Morgan, I've got to assume they've got some big celebrations planned. Parade happening tomorrow in Arlington. The route has already been shared. You can uh, only imagine how many people are going to come out when you realize that it's been more than six decades. This team never won a World Series. Now they've got the, they're going to have the rings. They're going to have, they already have the pride. So uh, expect this area all around me to be covered with people uh, in just a little bit more than 24 hours. All right, Joe. something to look forward to there. Morgan Chesky, thank you so much. More to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, holding steady. The Federal Reserve announcing it won't raise interest rates for the second month in a row. We're going to break down that decision and what it means for you. First, though, after the break, chaos in the cockpit. A Delta pilot accused of pulling a gun on the plane's captain while in the air. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're back now with another report of a cockpit confrontation involving a commercial airline pilot. In this case, a Delta Airlines co-pilot is facing charges of pulling a gun and threatening to shoot the captain during an argument. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has the details. It happened on a Delta Airlines flight last year. Now a federal grand jury has indicted First Officer Jonathan Dunn with using a dangerous weapon to assault and intimidate the captain, telling the captain he'd be shot multiple times if he diverted the flight due to a passenger's medical event. Dunn was trained and certified to carry a gun as a TSA flight deck officer. NBC News aviation analyst Captain John Cox was also certified. The people that were really heavily into the, I'm going to save the world and I've got a gun. Those people didn't make it through. NBC has been unable to reach Dunn. Delta says he no longer works for the airline. The indictment comes after an off-duty Alaska Airlines pilot riding in a cockpit jump seat last week allegedly tried to shut down the engines on a passenger plane. Joseph Emerson has pleaded not guilty to 83 attempted murder counts. He allegedly claimed he was in a mental health crisis and had consumed psychedelic mushrooms two days before the flight. He had no intention to harm himself or anybody on the airplane when he acted. The challenge for the FAA and airlines screening pilots for signs of serious mental illness or aggression. It's really hard to predict violence, even if somebody is experiencing mental health symptoms. Both pilots face federal charges of interfering with a flight crew, a felony that carries up to 20 years in prison. 
Back to you. All right, Tom, thank you. Devastating scenes are still coming out of Mexico a week after Hurricane Otis made landfall. Residents are struggling to get basic necessities like food and water as the death toll continues to climb and dozens remain missing. NBC's Valerie Castro has the latest. A humanitarian crisis exploding in Acapulco, Mexico. After Hurricane Otis ripped through the beach resort town a week ago, destroying infrastructure and flooding streets and homes. Up and down the coastline, the horrifying evidence of Otis's wrath. Boats thrown like toys along the shore. Many residents now feeling as though they've been left to fend for themselves. Queremos ayuda. Ayuda. Se nos fue todo en el agua. No, no, no. Clean drinking water becoming scarce. Authorities say just 35% of water service has been restored. Lines of desperate residents snaking through the streets, people waiting to collect it by the jug full. But the wait itself is dangerous. ¿Dónde está el gobierno? ¿Dónde está el apoyo del gobierno? Mire usted si quiere ver. La fila nos dicen que desde las 8 nosotros estamos aquí desde la madrugada 5 de la mañana arriesgando que nos asalten porque ahora están asaltando en las calles. Looting in the days after the storm stripped store shelves bare. Food now coming from a government-backed community kitchen. NGOs like World Central Kitchen stepping up to meet the demand. We are putting out 3,000 meals. Yesterday it was 2,500, so each day we're looking to increase our output more and more. Otis's rapid escalation from a tropical storm to a monster Cat 5 hurricane in just 12 hours, leaving residents like this woman with little time to prepare. She thought the rising floodwaters would be the death of her, her husband keeping her calm through the worst of it, the couple surviving, but now struggling. Mexican president deploying more than 10,000 troops and 1,000 government workers to deal with the aftermath. Government officials unveiling a $3.4 billion recovery plan, but experts estimate the cost of the damage could be as high as $15 billion. The human cost of the storm continues to climb. At least 45 people killed, including one American. Loved ones of those lost seen waiting outside the morgue. Por la falta de luz. This funeral homeowner says he can't prepare bodies for burial until power is restored, now taking in more of the dead than he can handle, while families wait to lay their loved ones to rest. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. The official death toll is expected to continue rising with at least 47 people still missing right now. The Navy is focused on searching through more than 30 boats that sank in Acapulco Bay on the night of the hurricane. Let's get more international news now with the latest out of Ukraine. The Russian offensive continues. More than 100 Ukrainian towns were hit in just 24 hours. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has that and other international news. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joel. That's right. According to the uh, Interior Minister of Ukraine, at, at Russia bombarded about 118 cities and towns across Ukraine in the space of just 24 hours. That is more than any other day this year. Now, the minister also said that 10 out of Ukraine's 27 regions have come under major attack with death tolls and injuries on the rise. And now officials say Russia is doubling down in the pursuit of Avdivka, a town in the eastern Donetsk region of Ukraine. A local leader say uh, there have been more than 40 massive shelling attacks against the territorial community. This is the 88th week of this ongoing war. Let's travel over to Kenya, where King Charles III held a private meeting with the family of a Kenyan leader who was executed by the British. Dedan Kimati was a former leader of the Kenyan rebellion against British colonial rule who was hanged by the British administration. The British High Commission says the meeting was a, quote, opportunity for the king to hear firsthand about the violence committed against Kenyans during their struggle for independence. King Charles expressed the greatest sorrow and the deepest regret for the violence of that era. We end this new tour of the world in Mexico for a celebration of the Day of the Dead, also known as the Dia de los Muertos. And it is truly a celebration. Bright colors and smells filled Mexico as this community honors their ancestors. It's a tradition that goes back thousands of years. And if you're a Disney fan, it's also featured in the popular movie Coco. 
Yesterday, today, celebrants believe that the spirits of the dead return home to spend time with their loved ones. Families welcome them with altars, sugar skulls, bright decorations and candles to remember the deceased. So happy Dia de los Muertos to everyone. Absolutely. It's a beautiful Bye. celebration. Claudio, thank you so much. Coming up, somber statistics from the CDC. Infant deaths are on the rise for the first time in two decades. We're going to look at the numbers plus the groups most at risk. And fear in Jewish communities across America as the war in the Middle East continues, how some are looking to protect themselves. This is Morning News Now. We're back with an alarming new report from the CDC on the rise of infant deaths in the U.S. That report says the country's infant mortality rate increased for the first time in 20 years. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now with a closer look at the findings. So first of all, remind us how infant mortality is measured and why did we see this rise in last year's numbers? So the infant mortality rate is the number of deaths before one year per 1,000 live births. What was really critical about this report, and I want to be very, very clear about this, is that while the rate was increasing in white infants, black infants disproportionately represent the absolute number. They are still more than twice as likely to die than their white counterparts. It depends on who you ask in terms of an explanation for why. But if you think about when something like this happens, you have to say what was happening in our world, in our country, that could affect women, um, disproportionately versus men, especially women of reproductive age. And there's two things that, that, that stand out. Number one was the pandemic. That significantly reduced the access to prenatal care for so many women across this country. And the second one is the Dobbs decision. And this is really critically important, especially in those four states, Georgia, Missouri, Iowa, and Texas, three of them, all except Iowa, instated really strict abortion restriction laws right around this time. And that's felt to have completely impacted the care of the women who are pregnant, which will impact infant, infant mortality rates. We saw an increase in infants who died from pregnancy complications. Yes, exactly. Talk more about that. So typically, we talk about infant mortality is related, number one, to you know congenital anomalies, things that happen you can't you know, have any effect over or preterm delivery. Those were not necessarily increased. What they did see were increased complications during pregnancy, as you said, one of them being something called cervical incompetency. That means the cervix opens before it should. And something else called premature rupture of your membranes, which basically your fluid, your fluid ruptures, that can increase the risk of miscarriage as well as infection, as well as preterm birth. And all of those things, aside from miscarriage, preterm and infection, can significantly impact the survival of an infant in the first year. You mentioned the disparities in race. I just want to repeat this number because yes. I think it's so important. The report found black infants still dying at more than twice the rate yes. of white infants. Right. This is not something new, but nope. to see those numbers laid out this way, how do we move forward? What does this information tell us? So it tells us that there were significant and anticipated repercussions from the Dobbs decision, and that women of color and minorities and communities of color that have always been impacted more by these social determinants of health, that this is still happening. It should be a wake-up call. I'm sure that all of my colleagues in the reproductive health care space are disheartened by this news, not necessarily surprised, and there are so many different places, society, education, access that need to change. It's not, a, it's not a simple solution. It's important we have these conversations, but we have to see change when exactly. it comes to this. All right, Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you so you much. Bet. Appreciate it. The sharp rise of anti-Semitic threats in the U.S. since Hamas's attack on Israel is leading to new fears of safety within Jewish communities across the country. And in South Florida, those concerns have become a literal call to arms, as NBC News correspondent Sam Brock reports. Let it go. Between the sounds of gunfire... All right, go ahead, whenever you're ready. ...and the gasps of what they produce... Oh, I got pretty good. Here in South Florida, some members of the Jewish community arming themselves following Hamas's brutal attack on October 7th and the anti-Semitic threats that have followed. Graffiti inside of the neighborhood which says that says, uh, free Gaza, kill all the Jews. And I'm, I'm a Jewish and I have uh, two little kids. And I just want to be able to defend myself. Sahar Kinnair, one of many Jewish mothers we met, now trying out firearms. 
after seeing violent rhetoric creep onto their streets. One mom, Michelle, worries about her kids walking home from school. Who isn't upset over everything that's happening and, and, and any innocent life is that's being destroyed is horrific. But screaming for the death, my death, because I'm a Jew? No. This firearm instruction class in the Miami area is led by gun store owner David Kowalski. It's one of those things that you don't want to need and not have. How many of you never thought you would ever personally own or use a gun? The class featuring a profile of people you might not expect to find. Grandmothers and guns, not always an obvious pairing. I'm like having an out-of-body experience sitting here. But as Israel's campaign in Gaza grows more deadly, so too does the fear of backlash. Every single country, every single town is demonstrating against our people. We feel terrified. Well, it's going to be loud. It's going to go. Kowalski says his classes have gone from one or two a week to one or two a day. After the Hamas invasion, did you see an immediate change at your business? Yes, absolutely. Um, there was definitely an uptick in Jewish Americans wanting to learn how to protect themselves and their families. For many of the firearms newcomers we met, there are still reservations. No, scary. Oh, very good. It's it's scary. Very good. But for others, there is no longer a choice. People who can't respect human life, how can you think that they're going to care about yours? A concern that's growing in Jewish communities all over the country. Sam Brock. NBC News, South Florida. Coming up on hold, the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates on pause, at least for now. One of our favorite financial experts, Caleb Silver, is here to break down what it means for you. And, oh, Christmas tree, one of the most famous signs of the holiday season, now on its way to 30 rocks soon. I'll tell you more, all the details about it. You're watching Morning News. Welcome back. Federal Reserve once again holding off on raising interest rates. This is the second month in a row that the central bank has paused those rate hikes. For some context, the Fed began bumping up rates back in March of 2022 with the goal of taming inflation. Right now, interest rates are at the highest level we have seen in 23 years. For more on what this means, we're joined, of course, by Investopedia Editor-in-Chief Caleb Silver. No surprise here with the pause. What does this signal to us? Yeah, no surprise. We got what we expected and kind of a gentler tone from Jerome Powell, the Fed chair. But he did say we may still raise rates again at that next meeting, which is coming up in December. Data dependent. So there's going to be two jobs reports before that next meeting, two inflation reports before that next meeting. And what's the Fed watching? It's watching the labor market very closely, and it's watching overall inflation, which has come down, just not close enough to the Fed's target of 2 2.5%. Really, we kind of knew there'd be a pause. What you were really listening for was what Powell said afterward, right? Right. And that's what you expected? Yeah. And he did say something that I thought was interesting, which he said, we're not even thinking about thinking about cutting rates anytime soon. A lot of people had expected the Fed to start cutting rates, maybe by the end of the first quarter of next year or by mid next year. They're not even thinking about thinking about it because they don't have economic conditions where they want, though they're trending in the right direction. So interest rates are just one measure of, of our economic picture. The GDP is growing, inflation ticking up once again. What does this tell us right now about the overall direction of the economy, especially as, as we head into the holidays? Yeah, well, things have definitely gotten better. Supply chain constraints are easing. Consumers continue to spend despite this rise in rates. Rates. So that's good. But the labor market has been exceptionally strong. Remember, back in September, there was 336,000 jobs added. We were not expecting that. And there's still a lot of jobs available when we look at the job openings and labor turnover survey. So a lot of job openings, a lot of hiring, and wages are still increasing just a little bit. These are all things that show the Fed that things are a little too hot still, and they may yet have to raise rates again or keep them this high for longer than we expected in the next year. Tomorrow is the jobs report, right? What, what are you looking for? What can we we expect. Yeah, we're probably going to get, we think, about 180,000 jobs added, which is a more normal state of hiring in this country. We, 336,000 is a huge number, and we weren't expecting that. So that's a steady state. The unemployment rate, we want to watch that closely. The Fed wants to keep maximum employment. That's between 3.5% and 4%. We're at 3.8%. So check on that. But if wages continue to rise, that puts pressure on companies, then companies make cutbacks, and the Fed doesn't want that to happen. So we're going to watch wages, and we're going to watch the second that have been hiring. If it's broad-based hiring, that's a good sign. But if it's in one area exclusively and wages take off, the Fed might have to raise rates 
in December at that meeting. All right. Caleb Silver, as always, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Some more financial headlines now. Lyft and Uber shelling out some major cash over wage theft allegations in New York. CNBC Savannah now has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Yeah, that's right. So Uber and Lyft will pay nearly $330 million combined to settle claims by New York's attorney general. They cheated drivers out of pay and benefits. More than 100,000 current and former ride-sharing drivers in the state could be eligible to receive money from the settlement. Current drivers will also be guaranteed minimum hourly rates and paid sick leave and be given notice and support to address issues about working conditions. Disney officially plans to buy the remaining 33% stake in Hulu it doesn't own. NBC Universal exercising its right to sell the stake after the window to do so opened up yesterday. Disney expects to pay roughly $8.6 billion for the streaming service. It gained the controlling stake in Hulu when it bought Fox's film and TV assets. Now, Hulu had more than 48 million subscribers at the end of Disney's last quarter. And Six Flags and Cedar Fair are joining forces. The Wall Street Journal confirming the companies are merging in a $2 billion deal to create a regional powerhouse in the theme park industry. The new company will have more than 40 amusement and water parks in 17 states, Canada and Mexico, which could help it compete with bigger rivals such as Disney and Universal Studios. Attendance at theme parks has yet to fully rebound to pre-pandemic levels. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. You got it, Joe. Well, it is official. We're heading into the holiday season. And what better way to really get into the spirit than with a Christmas tree, a really big Christmas tree, the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, to be exact, which has now been chosen. It's an 80-foot-tall Norway spruce weighing in at around 12 tons. Right now, it's still firmly rooted in Vestal, New York. It's about three hours from the Big Apple, but soon it will sit right in front of 30 Rock, overlooking that iconic skating rink in Rockefeller Plaza. The tree is set to arrive on the plaza November 11th. That's a week from this Saturday, and the lighting will take place after Thanksgiving on November 29th. Looking forward to that. Coming up, running for redemption. One man shares his inspiring journey from a prison cell to the starting line as he prepares to run the New York City Marathon. Welcome back. Members of the original Mean Girls cast have reunited for, get this, a new ad for Walmart. Returning to the North Shore High School winter talent show as grown-ups. Take a look. Ladies. You take that one and you take that one. I am such a good mom. I'm impressed. And I'm Karen. (laughs) That's right. Some of the movie's stars, including Lindsay Lohan, Amanda Seyfried, and Lacey Chabert, all appear in the Black Friday commercial, which recreates some of the 2004 movie's most famous scenes, notably missing... Rachel McAdams. On top of that, a movie of the Mean Girls musical is due out in the new year. And of course, here on Morning News Now, we are still faithfully observing Pink Wednesdays. Finally, this hour, a marathon is a major accomplishment for anyone. But for one runner who's lacing up their shoes this Sunday in the New York City Marathon, it's going to be a big step from where he started. NBC News Now anchor Kate Snow explains. For Rasan Thomas, running feels like freedom. The native New Yorker training for the city's upcoming marathon after 22 years behind bars. My first marathon was in San Quentin State Prison. It was 105 laps around a prison yard. In 2000, Rasan was locked up for shooting and killing a man during a drug deal. But while facing a life sentence, he turned his own life around. In prison, Rasan got an associate's degree and started writing for the San Quentin News. It was something to be really proud of. He even co-hosted a podcast about prison life that was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. It's also where he met volunteer teacher Claire Gelbert. And we just sort of hit it off. The two made a pact to one day run the New York City Marathon. So you make this deal that it, when you get out, if you get out, you're we'll going to do it together. together. Yes. Uh, what's, what's up, James? What's up, Mom? Rasan's sentence was commuted by California's governor for dedicating himself to his rehabilitation and he was released this February. You aren't healed up yet? He and Claire now running with a new mission for Empowerment Avenue, a group Rasan founded to help publish the work of incarcerated writers and artists. If you just treat people like human beings, you change their hearts, you change their minds. His hope to change the American prison system one step at a time. 
For people that hear you're running and hear your story and think, but wait a second, he killed someone. Yeah. What do you say to them? First, I say, I'm sorry. And then I would say, um, I can't pay my debt sitting in the cell. If I can make people who once harmed society love society, that's the best way I can pay for my crimes. You can't ever undo the past. There's no way to restore that justice. The only thing I can do is pay it forward. Kate Snow, NBC News, New York. Yeah. It is so cool to see. We wish him the best. They've done a few stories on the Ear Hustle podcast. It's truly incredible to see what those guys are doing, including some of them now out of prison. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. News continues right now. Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off today. Right now on Morning News Now, stepped up violence in Gaza. Israeli forces launch a second strike on that refugee camp in the Gaza Strip in as many days, saying they've killed another Hamas commander. Meanwhile, a tense moment for President Biden overnight, interrupted by a protester at a campaign event in Minnesota who called for the violence overseas to stop. We've got the president's response in just a moment. Plus more on the first Americans to be evacuated from Gaza. Back stateside, it's another day in court for Donald Trump Jr. He's expected to return to the stand in that high-profile civil fraud case against the Trump Organization. We'll take you inside that New York courtroom for his testimony as we look ahead to appearances from his siblings, Eric and Ivanka. Plus, if you build it, history on the baseball diamond as the Texas Rangers best the Arizona Diamondbacks in five. Now they're bringing the World Series title back to the Lone Star State for the first time in the club's history. And it's been a long and winding road for the Beatles. More than 50 years after the release of their final album, they're releasing one last song. We begin this hour in the Middle East, where Israeli ground forces are advancing inside Gaza. Israeli fighter jets are continuing to bombard the Palestinian enclave, yesterday hitting a densely populated refugee camp for a second straight day. The violence comes as for the first time President Biden called for a humanitarian pause. NBC's Raf Sanchez has the latest from southern Israel. Guys, good morning. President Biden has been firm in his support of Israel's right to defend itself after Hamas's terror attack. And he has so far rejected calls for a ceasefire despite the rising death toll in Gaza. But he is now saying he would like to see at least temporary halts to the fighting to allow more time to get prisoners out. Overnight, for the first time, President Biden calling for a humanitarian pause in the Israel-Hamas war. After being interrupted by a protester demanding a ceasefire, the president responding, quote, I think we need a pause. Earlier, the president said the U.S. is working to get Americans out of Gaza. Working nonstop to get Americans out of Gaza as soon and as safely as possible. And this morning, documents obtained by NBC News show around 400 U.S. citizens have been cleared to pass through the Rafah crossing today into the safety of Egypt. The border opened to civilians Wednesday for the first time since the start of the war after painstaking negotiations. But only a handful of U.S. citizens made it out, including 71-year-old aid worker Ramona Akamara who came to Gaza to make prosthetic limbs for children. For her family, deep relief. I, I just want to throw my arms around her and hold on to her forever. But for Palestinians without a foreign passport, the only ticket out is a serious injury. Eight-year-old Salem was one of around 70 patients evacuated for urgent medical care in Egypt. His family says he was injured by an Israeli airstrike and tells us his parents and grandparents were killed. Yesterday, Israeli warplanes hit a refugee camp in northern Gaza for the second time in two days, targeting what Israel says was a military command center deliberately hidden underneath civilian homes. These images show the scale of the destruction. Today, Israeli troops continuing to push deeper into the Strip in their effort to crush Hamas, but also taking casualties, at least 16 soldiers killed since the start of the invasion. Yet more grief in a holy land that's already seen too much of it. 
And Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is due to land here in Israel tomorrow for his third visit since October 7th. We're expecting him to carry a message of support, but also to push the Israelis to allow more aid into Gaza and to start working towards those humanitarian pauses. Guys. All right, Raf, thank you so much. A major concern for Israeli soldiers continues to be the underground tunnel systems built by Hamas. Several hostage survivors are shedding light on the conditions of the tunnels. And officials fear they could prove difficult to attack. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman takes a closer look. As Israel fights intense ground battles in Gaza, the greatest threat may be underground. Hamas tunnels, hundreds of them, promoted on their social media. Some storing weapons and fighters. Others command posts, concealed from Israel's drones and spy planes. Hamas claims it's built more than 300 miles of tunnels, half as long as New York's subway, crisscrossing an area just 25 miles long. It smells, it's dark, it's, it's closing on you, it's scary. It's also where many of the 240 hostages are believed to be held. We have to measure twice and three times that uh, they are not in those tunnels that we are bombing. One of the released hostages said she was held in a tunnel with four others. It looks like a spider web. In this Hamas video, fighters are seen popping out of tunnels, simulating an attack on Israeli tanks. It's a threat not unlike what the U.S. faced in Iraq. ISIS ambushing troops from tunnels under Mosul and Fallujah. Ben Milch, originally from Iowa, came face to face with Hamas when his IDF unit destroyed tunnels in the 2014 Gaza war. We would fire at them, and then they would go into their tunnel and run and pop up in another location. Israel says the tunnels have gotten more sophisticated, as deep as 230 feet, fortified by concrete, wired for electricity and ventilation, and booby-trapped. And no one knows exactly where they all are. Nobody but Hamas. We have a good grasp of the network, but of course it's only part of the picture. Destroying them won't be easy. Israel says Hamas has built tunnels under homes and mosques, risking civilian lives. Experts say Israel could hit some with U.S.-made bunker buster bombs, but likely with severe civilian casualties. Tunnels can also be flooded with seawater. And Israel could use new technology, a sponge bomb, described to NBC News by someone shown the device by the IDF. A mix of chemicals dropped into a tunnel creates a foam that expands, hardens, and seals the entrance, at least temporarily. Imperfect solutions to a lethal threat lurking underground. Josh Letterman, NBC News, Tel Aviv. Amid the violence in the Middle East, tensions are boiling over on college campuses here in the U.S., with rising incidents of hate being reported in both Muslim and Jewish communities. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us from Atlanta with more on this. Blaine, good morning. Well, Joe, good morning to you. I've spoken with a number of students who say that they have experienced a range of actions from shouted chants on campus to troubling social media posts, even the defacing of a poster with Israeli hostages. All of it, they say, makes them feel unsafe on campus. Now, of course, all of this comes as both Jewish and Muslim leaders say that they're facing an unprecedented rise in threats of violence. <laughs> Thousands of miles from the escalating violence in the Middle East, the cloud of war is smothering many college campuses here in the U.S. At Emory University in Atlanta, more than 100 Jewish students gathered Wednesday, one of at least six schools statewide, to hold solidarity walks after a rise in anti-Semitic incidents on campuses nationwide. We had hung up posters of the hostages in Gaza, and there were students who went and vandalized them. As someone who knows people who are a part of that group of hostages, it's just horrible. What's your biggest concern? My biggest concern, I mean, violence, obviously, you know, I mean, and it's, it's not unfounded. I mean, violent threats. Threats like those made at Cornell University, which has canceled classes Friday, citing extraordinary stress on campus. Patrick Dye, a 21-year-old junior at the Ivy League school, made his first court appearance Wednesday after authorities say he posted online threats to kill members of the school's Jewish community. He did not enter a plea. All of it comes as tensions are rising across the country. The Biden administration is vowing to fight a sharp rise in anti-Semitic and Islamophobic incidents. We are focusing our efforts on confronting and disrupting illegal threats wherever they arise. 
Similar to reports of anti-Semitic incidents, which have skyrocketed in recent weeks, the Council on American-Islamic Relations says it's seen a large uptick, noting many more often go unreported. Overall, there is a sense of anxiety uneasiness, our community is on edge. As the incidents of violent threats soar, many are just hoping for a common understanding. There has been deaths on both sides, which is a horrible thing. There should be no deaths on any side at all. Now here in Georgia, the leader of a statewide organization for Jewish college students is calling on campuses across the state to increase security, writing in an open letter that students are literally afraid to be on campus. Joe. All right, Blaine, thank you so much. In other news, Donald Trump Jr. will be back in a New York courtroom today for more testimony. He's going to take the stand again in the $250 million civil fraud trial against the former president's family and their company. Yesterday, he faced questions about his involvement with financial documents that the New York Attorney General's office says were purposely inflated to benefit the company. Trump Jr. testified that while he signed off on financial documents, he was not involved in preparing them. MSNBC anchor Lindsay Reiser joined us now from outside the courthouse. So, Lindsay, what were some of the big takeaways from Don Jr.'s testimony yesterday? Well, Joe, to start, he did appear very relaxed. And at a few times during the day, he even joked with the judge. At one point, the judge asking him to slow down. And he had joked and said, I moved to Florida, but I kept the New York pace. Overall, though, he testified to his role as executive vice president of the Trump Organization and trustee, testifying to the titles and involvement in properties, like in securing loans for new developments, loans that in order to get, they would show these statements of financial condition. These are the documents that the AG's office alleges contain these overvaluations that contain Don Jr.'s signature. And he testified that his father, the former president, was his supervisor until he left for the presidency. But he essentially pointed the finger at people like Donald Bender from Mazars, the accounting firm that would help them compile uh, a lot of their documents that would contain their assets and those valuations. And also pointing the finger at former CFO Alan Weisselberg, who you'll remember served time at Rikers as part of the uh, criminal Trump organization uh, fraud trial that was essentially accusing the organization of giving off the books perks to employees. That was part of the allegation. And so today we can definitely expect to hear uh, some more of that direct questioning from the state and also more about his involvement. Now, the attorney general overnight posted a video essentially saying that even though he had this big role with the company, he he showed very little knowledge of the legal and accounting mechanics, a lot of things that he wasn't able to recall. So we can expect to hear more of that today, Joe. Yeah. Uh, what else can we expect to hear today? We know Donald Trump Jr., also Eric Trump expected to testify. So what are you watching out for in court? And so once we are done with the direct, then we will have the cross-examination of the defense team. Remember, Don Jr., Eric, the former president himself, Ivanka, these are being called as state witnesses, and so they are compelled to testify. And so once Don Jr. is done, then we can expect Eric Trump to be called to the stand. And Eric, according to the AG's office, is responsible for all aspects of the management and operation of the Trump organization, including new project acquisition, development, and construction, saying he he actively spearheaded the growth of Trump golf, including the addition of properties since 2006. We can expect to hear more about the properties like Seven Springs and Westchester that the AG's office says was overvalued as well. Remember in his deposition, he said he couldn't recall a lot of details. He, uh, he said... Um, that uh, they happened years ago, that he and his brother had other things on their plate. So we can expect to hear some of that from his testimony because we heard it in the deposition. And remember, Joe, he had invoked the Fifth Amendment in his deposition more than 500 times, according to sources. In this civil trial, if he or any of the other defendants or witnesses do invoke the Fifth Amendment privilege, then the judge can have a negative inference off of that, Joe. And, Lindsay, we just saw the calendar. The former president set to testify next week. And this is a trial that still has several weeks left, right? 
Right. And so we're expecting to hear from the former president on Monday and then Ivanka on Wednesday. Ivanka is no longer a co-defendant. She was removed through an appeals court motion over the summer because of the statute of limitations. But these are the state's final witnesses. I mean, we heard from the state's only expert witness on disgorgement, this idea of how much was made off of an illegal activity. Remember, the judge has already found the defendants liable for fraud. And so a lot of this trial is the other causes like falsifying business documents, insurance, fraud, but a lot of it is damages, Joe. The AG's office asking for $250 million. Yesterday, their expert testifying that banks lost out on $168 million in earned interest that they could have gotten had they charged higher interest rates with the higher risk, had they known some of these valuations. This is according to the AG's office. But Joe, you asked how much longer it could go on. We're expecting it to go through December 22nd. All right. Lindsay Reiser reporting from New York. Thank you so much. Another big legal story. Jury deliberations expected to get underway in the Sam Bankman Freed trial today. The defense delivered closing arguments on Wednesday, saying the government <clears throat> is turning the FTX founder into a, quote, monster and arguing that bad business decisions, which led to the downfall of his company, are not a crime. Today, the government will make its final case before the jury begins to deliberate. Bankman Freed faces up to life in prison if convicted of criminal fraud. He denies the charges. Now to your morning news now weather forecast as the Pacific Northwest braces for a mix of some wet winter weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us with that. Angie, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Ready or not, here it comes. The rain, the snow, we're dealing with it across the Pacific Northwest. And you can see it's quite a soggy morning in places like Seattle. But stretching all the way down into NorCal, you're seeing the rain. And if you move a little farther to the east across Idaho and into portions of Montana, we've got the snow falling in kind of that wintry mix that folks there are dealing with. And this is going to be something we watch over the next couple of days and even into the weekend as an atmospheric river event, a weak one, but still nonetheless an atmospheric river event continues to unfold. Here's the deal right now. This is a look through the rest of your Thursday. This kind of plume of moisture works its way slowly but surely inland. It's going to leave us with some gusty winds, some heavy rain in some spots, and the potential for some localized flooding. But notice again, there is some snow falling in some of those higher elevations in parts of the Rockies. So a heads up there. As we get into tomorrow, that snow will start to accumulate near Yellowstone, near Grand Teton. We'll see some of the showers, not a whole lot, but if some of those showers working into portions of the northern plains as well. This is the area we're really focusing in on for flood risk and flash flood risk at that. We could see hourly rainfall rates of a half an inch or higher, mostly in those higher elevations, but still watch for that with some really saturated grounds of what we've already dealt with yesterday, which was heavy rain, more rain on top of that isn't going to be hard to see some flooding concerns there. When it comes to the winter alerts there, up across much of this, the region that I showed you that's going to uh, be impacted with snow, we've got Missoula, Bozeman, all included in that. Uh, and you can see adding on some additional rainfall Anywhere from one to three inches is what's likely. Uh, I think three inches is on the higher end. The more widespread amounts are going to be about a quarter of an inch. So heads up there. Here's the snowfall totals. You'll end up uh, with uh, just an isolated uh, couple of spots with some maybe eight inches. But for the most part, Yellowstone, Jackson, uh, going to be looking really gorgeous. Winter wonderland there over the next couple of days. And of course, the chill is in the air. 66 million people under these frost and freeze alerts, mostly across the southeast with temperatures right now. Look at look at Cincinnati, 27 degrees. It's only November 2nd. We're not ready for this. Nashville at 29, Montgomery at 30 degrees. So the extra layers are a must this morning. You'll be able to uh, ditch them kind of as we get into the mm -hmm. weekend, but you're, you're still going to need them this afternoon. So keep those handy. But look ahead to Friday, warm sunshine for the south. So you'll get those 70s back in the picture across Texas. It'll remain cool and crisp across the northeast, but a whole lot of sunshine for most of the country, except for the Pacific Northwest, where unfortunately, Unfortunately, another round of rain is going to work in as we get into Saturday. The rest of the country, though, really gorgeous conditions, bright conditions, still a little chilly across the Midwest, but dry, which we love to hear <laughs> on a Saturday in the Northeast. I think a lot of people are cheering <laughs> at their TV screens right now when I say that. <laughs> the mild highs will continue too, Joe. So it'll be a nice weekend, bright, and some really comfortable conditions here. 60s, not we'll bad. We'll take actual fall, yes. like real fall, I'm, which is great. I I'm going to be enjoying a pumpkin spice latte probably. There you go. I walked into Starbucks. They had the the Christmas cups out oh, today gosh, and all that. That's already. Right. I know. So maybe there you peppermint go. mocha. Then there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Appreciate <laughs> it. For the first time in their 63 year history, the Texas Rangers are World Series champions. The Rangers lifted up the Commissioner's Trophy after beating the Arizona Diamondbacks in Game Five last night to win the Fall Classic, capping off a perfect postseason on the road. 
NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from outside the Rangers ballpark in Arlington, Texas. Morgan, good morning. Yeah, Joe, it is a great morning here in Dallas and in Arlington, all across Ranger Nation, because everyone's saying the one word, finally. It has finally happened. And understand where this team has come from. you got to go back to 1961. They were the Washington Senators then. So two cities, five home ballparks, and six decades later, the Texas Rangers accomplished uh, finally what they did last night, beating the Arizona Diamondbacks to win their first World Series title. This morning, for the first time in franchise history, the Texas Rangers are World Series champions. The Rangers winning the last three straight games against the Arizona Diamondbacks to take the series, capping off an unprecedented, perfect postseason run on the road. Overnight in Arlington, fans going wild inside Globe Life Ballpark, even some crowd surfing. While in downtown Dallas, there was plenty of bubbling to go around. I cannot imagine um, this series being any more memorable in my whole life than I can even imagine. The game, a pure pitcher's duel for seven innings before the Rangers broke out with the first hit of the night. But it was the ninth inning that sealed the deal, with Marcus Simeon crushing a two-run homer, putting Texas up 5-0. Three outs later, Texas becoming World Series champs. Welcome back. The trial of Caitlin Armstrong got underway yesterday. She's the former yoga instructor accused of killing an elite female cyclist in 2022. Prosecutors say the killing happened as a result of romantic jealousy. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest. Hey there, this trial almost didn't happen as authorities say Caitlin Armstrong went on the run almost immediately once she became a suspect. But now she's in court listening as prosecutors try to convince a jury this is all about a love triangle that turned deadly. Anna Mariah Wilson was a rising star in the world of off-road cycling. This is Mariah Wilson. This morning, new details of the last moments of her life captured on audio. Those screens are followed by... Two gunshots. One to the front of the head, one to the side of the head. Prosecutors in opening statements portraying her accused killer, Caitlin Armstrong, as a woman consumed by jealousy. One of the things you'll hear is she was not happy with this relationship. Colin. Not happy, authorities say, after discovering she and Wilson were romantically involved with the same man, professional cyclist Colin Strickland. Prosecutors say Armstrong tracked Wilson's location using a fitness app and that surveillance footage puts her Jeep near the apartment where Wilson was staying. According to a police affidavit, investigators also received an anonymous tip after the shooting that Armstrong said months earlier she was so angry she wanted to kill Wilson. Armstrong, who has pleaded not guilty, now facing decades behind bars if convicted of first-degree murder. Her defense team arguing there is no proof she committed the crime. You did not hear about any direct evidence showing Caitlin Armstrong is responsible for this crime because there is a Armstrong's legal team also battling accusations. She fled the country after the murder and underwent plastic surgery to disguise her identity. Authorities say she used her sister's passport to travel to Costa Rica. A warrant was issued for her arrest, setting off a 43-day manhunt. While in Costa Rica, she searched her name from her cell phone. News article. Just weeks ago, this cell phone video appearing to show Armstrong trying to escape, running from corrections officers while at a doctor's appointment, later captured a mile away. NBC News has reached out to attorneys on both sides for comment about this case, but the court has imposed a gag order preventing them from talking. We have also not heard back from the family members. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos for more on this. So let's pick it up with that last little bit of video there, the alleged escape attempt. Uh, this week, the judge says the prosecution can use that in their case. How could this affect the case? It's just more evidence of what we call consciousness of guilt. Uh, the wicked person only fleeth uh, because they are wicked. And I'm butchering I think it's a Bible passage, but uh, the point is that people who are guilty run away, and that's something prosecutors will show the jury, just as they did show and will show that she fled to Costa Rica. People don't do that. People don't run away 
if they're innocent. This is very common evidence to come in at a criminal trial. And it's really pretty devastating. It's very hard for the defense to counter that fact. If somebody ran away, moved to Costa Rica, got plastic surgery, innocent people don't do that. I'm almost giving a prosecutor's closing argument there, but that is exactly the point that we'll make. Let's talk more about the opening argument from the prosecution. They made an emotional appeal describing Mo Wilson's final moments, talking about they plan to present videos, cell phone, ballistic DNA evidence in the trial. Thoughts on their opening statements and how they're approaching this case? Opening statements are different from closing statements and that opening statements are really just a narrative. You can use the language the evidence will show, but I mean, really, it's just a recitation of the facts. You save your argument argument for the closing argument. And really, that's what the government, the prosecution is doing here, is laying out point by point all the circumstantial evidence they have. Because the one thing, admittedly, they don't have is what's called direct evidence. There isn't an eyewitness. This is not that uncommon. <clears throat> People who commit crimes do so out of the eyesight of other people. They don't want eyewitnesses. So commonly, prosecutors only have circumstantial evidence, pieces of evidence that place together, put together the pieces of a puzzle. And there may still be a few pieces missing, but overall, you can figure out what the picture is, whether it's the Mona Lisa or it's something else. The opening statement for the defense, there was some tension. There were a lot of objections during it, but basically, in the end, the defense is arguing, hey, you had tunnel vision here. You didn't look at anyone else. Is this the argument you expect what do you make of the defense's case? The old tunnel vision chestnut. I've used it many times myself. Look, if you're, if you're reading between the lines, what this seems to me is a case that probably the defense at some point said to their client, you should really think about a plea. This is a really tough case. I see all of the classic markers, and I think you'll see it in closing, of a really difficult case for the defense, which is, hey, there may be all this circumstantial evidence, but ladies and uh, members of the jury, no one actually saw this crime take place. That's, you know, that's a tough argument to make. I expect you'll see a lot of time devoted to the prosecution as the burden to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, because that's the argument you make in, on the defense when you don't have a whole lot else. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of that and them hammering down on the whole tunnel vision uh, thing. I do it myself. And the point that there weren't any eyewitnesses to this crime, because other than that, they don't have a lot else. All right. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Appreciate it. International headlines now. A major storm is slamming Western Europe this morning. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga has more on that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. That's right. Storm Kiron has arrived on the English coast last night, bringing heavy rain and high winds to the area. And now the whole of Western Europe is bracing for some of the highest wind speeds it has seen in decades in this region. Now, flights and public transportation across the region have been cancelled, and now residents are taking cover as the storm tracks through northwestern France. Now let's head over to Pakistan, where hundreds of thousands of undocumented Afghan migrants are facing deportation. The Pakistani government gave a surprise announcement last month over plans to arrest and deport an estimated 1.7 million undocumented people starting November 1st, yesterday. Now, the United Nations Human Rights Office says the move could cause a human rights catastrophe. On Wednesday, dozens of Afghans were already rounded up and deported. And according to the Pakistani Interior Ministry, some 140,000 have left already the country in recent weeks, fearing arrest and heading towards an uncertain future. And we end our short tour of the world in Hong Kong, where the FinTech conference is happening this week. The theme for the flagship event is FinTech Redefined, where global leaders gather to help shape the future of technology and finance. Just today, it was announced that early next month, people in Hong Kong and Thailand will be able to use a digital payment system that will eliminate the need to exchange currencies. And as all speakers are attending the conference to talk about big topics like, like this, and plus the magic of artificial intelligence and the green finance. Back to you, John. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. It's an estimated one in six people globally are affected by infertility. And here in the U.S., Americans struggling with infertility can face big bills for fertility treatments. Well, now we're seeing a new trend of people taking on second jobs just for the fertility benefits. NBC News senior consumer investigative correspondent, News Now anchor Vicki Wynn joins us with more. Hey, Vicki, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. It is great to be with you. Yeah, fertility treatments like IVF can be really exciting expensive, anywhere from fifteen to $20,000 per attempt. And many of those costs end up coming out of pocket because insurance typically does not cover them. So some women have found a strategy to fund those costs 
taking on side hustles. Ordering a visit from the store. Wheel of fortune turn. If only having a baby were that easy. A common misconception as one in six adults worldwide experiences infertility. In the U.S. alone, one in seven women struggle to get pregnant or carry a pregnancy to term. Some turning to expensive fertility treatments for a chance at growing their families. The standard of care, which is often uh, in vitro fertilization, can cost somewhere between fifteen dollars to $20,000. Betsy Campbell of the National Infertility Association Resolve says many employers do not offer fertility benefits. The gap in coverage prompting some full-time employees to take on side hustles at companies like Amazon, Starbucks, Target, and Walmart all of which now provide fertility benefits to part-time workers. What do you make of women who are taking on these additional side jobs just for the benefits? I wish it weren't necessary. They should have access to all family building options, and it shouldn't matter who your employer is, what state you live in, the size of your bank account. In 2021, more than half of employers reported providing some level of fertility benefits, with 25% now offering in vitro fertilization or IVF coverage. I have a great party skill. I can make lattes and espressos. Just one of the perks Jennifer Arenas Cardenas still enjoys after side hustling at this Starbucks in Tucson, Arizona. A school psychologist by day, Jennifer became a barista by night and weekends working 20 hours a week to earn the benefits to cover a round of IVF estimated at $20,000. Either we're going to drain our savings or we're going to have to find another way to pay for it. How did you figure this out? I, I googled it. Starbucks health insurance covers up to $35,000 for fertility services and prescriptions. The coffee giant also offers reimbursement of up to $40,000 for adoption and surrogacy. Employees reaching eligibility after just five months on the grind. We're creating a more inclusive and equitable environment. Sarah Kelly says Starbucks sees a venti size return through employee attraction and retention. And 97% of employers surveyed say offering fertility benefits did not result in a big bump to their medical plan costs. Our employees, we believe in investing in them so that they can thrive will enable our business to thrive. Do you think people should be required to disclose if they're coming for those fertility benefits when they apply for a job at Starbucks? No, I do not. Jennifer moonlighted at Starbucks for more than a year and left once she and her husband received a double shot of their own. Last year, twins Gael and Rosalinda were born. They are my pride and joy. I love them. What do you say to people who might look at this and think, wow, you sort of gamed the system? The system is really gaming us. Infertility is a medical diagnosis. This should absolutely be covered by insurance companies. Only 21 states plus Washington, D.C. have passed laws requiring insurers to offer at least some fertility coverage. I am forced to work multiple jobs to make my dream of being a mom come true. In 2020, Jennifer spoke in front of an employee benefits trust board, which quickly approved fertility benefits for her entire district. So you've changed things for the better for other women and families. I have, I have. While Jennifer no longer needs a side hustle, she remains thankful to the one that helped her land the job she always wanted, being a mom, filling her cup in more ways than one. Mad devil shot there. Well, Jennifer tells us she plans to undergo another round of IVF in January. And by the way, what does part-time mean? Well, it varies by company, but it can range from 10 to 30 hours a week, Joe. So during the interview process, yeah. did Jennifer disclose, hey, I'm doing this because I want the benefits? I think that's a great question. I asked her the same thing because she was asked by the interviewers, you're already a school psychologist. Why do you want to come work for Starbucks? She did say it was for the benefits, not specifically the fertility benefits. But as you heard the Starbucks executive saying, they don't expect that you have to disclose that. They know they offer great benefits to attract people, and that's okay. I think the key here is if you want to go to your employer and say, we need to be offering this, go to Resolve. They have a whole template and a checklist for how you can start that conversation with human resources. And ultimately, it, it affects the bottom line in a positive way for these companies. Great story, important story too. All right, Vicki, thank Thanks, you so Jeff. much. Appreciate it. Coming up, is the truth really out there? Well, after the break, we're going to probe a new policy from the Pentagon on reporting UFO sightings to the government. 
Stick around, that's next. Welcome back. This week we saw a big verdict against the National Association of Realtors and some of the largest real estate brokerage firms in the country. The ruling could potentially transform the way people buy or sell their homes. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans has the details. A big win for homeowners as a federal jury in Kansas City found a system rigged against them. The jury's verdict siding with plaintiffs and against the National Association of Realtors, along with two brokerage firms. The case argued that forcing home sellers to pay the commission for the buyer's broker is an anti-competitive restraint and requires those sellers to pay an inflated amount. Jared Bright was a plaintiff in the class action suit. He understood he'd need to pay a seller's commission, but the buyer's agent too? Someone that I had never met, I will never meet, and did nothing for me. The jury awarded plaintiffs nearly $1.8 billion in a case led by attorney Michael Ketchmark. It's the only system, it's the only industry in, in the United States where two competitors get together, they set the compensation, and they split it. Here's how it works. When you sell your home, you agree to pay a commission to your agent and the buyer's agent, usually 6% of the home price. But this case argued that the buyer should pay their own agent and be able to negotiate that fee. The National Association of Realtors says it will appeal the verdict and that its rules prioritize consumers, support market-driven pricing, and promote business competition. But with housing now the least affordable it's been in a generation, the industry is facing increased scrutiny. That was Christine Romans reporting. When it comes to buying and selling homes, the way real estate agents earn their money and even whether home sellers will pay commissions in the future, that is now in question. More financial headlines now. Live Nation still in the hot seat as the Justice Department reportedly probes how the company plans its venues and its artists. CNBC's Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe, good morning. Yeah, so the Justice Department's investigation of Live Nation is focusing on whether the company uses anti-competitive deals with venues and other partners to book top talent and serve as the ticket service for those shows. Now, the Wall Street Journal reports the government is also exploring whether those deals restrict a venue's ability to work with other promoters. Now, the probe picked up steam last year after Ticketmaster crashed during the fan pre-sale for Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. Competitors say Live Nation pays artists more than other promoters can afford. Subaru is hopping on the Tesla bandwagon. The automaker will adopt Tesla's North American charging standard for certain electric vehicles starting in 2025. It will also supply charging adapters to customers who own or lease a vehicle with the standard charging system. Subaru has been slow to adopt EVs, currently only selling one model in partnership with Toyota. Tesla opened up its charging network last year. Asia is home to the majority of the world's most family-friendly airlines. The Family Vacation Guide compiled a list of more than 30 airlines based on factors such as pre-boarding options and free seat selection. Japan, Japan Airlines scored the highest, followed by Korean Air, China's Hainan Airlines, and Qantas. Now, all of the top 10 offer kids meals and free entertainment and allow strollers to be checked for free. Only one U.S. airline, that's Hawaiian, made the top 10, Joe. All right, Silvana, thank you so much. You got it. Well, the Pentagon is launching a brand new way to report UFOs. It's an online form which allows government employees or service members to share any information they have on government activity related to UFOs. It's the latest addition to the Pentagon's website dubbed the One Stop Shop for Public Records on Unidentified Phenomena. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby joins us now with more. I think, Courtney, a few years ago, the fact that we'd be talking about this with the Pentagon would have been hard to fathom. But tell us about this new online tool. What type of information can be reported here and how it's different from other ways of reporting UFO sightings. Yeah, Joe, you make an excellent point. This is almost becoming more mainstream. This talk of what the, the military, the Pentagon, the U.S. government calls UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. Now, this new reporting structure, it's a website, um, is only for U.S. government employees, current and former U.S. Co government contractors, former and cur current service members. And the idea is these are people who 
claim to have some knowledge of U.S. government or government um, programs that may have involved some sort of unidentified aerial phenomena. This is a much more uh, coordinated and um, a coordinated way for these employees, these people, former again, from former and current, to put together information that then the U.S. government will look into. It includes their contact information. They have to, to have verification that they have, in fact, worked for the U.S. government at some point and may have this level of knowledge. And the idea here is, is they're trying to essentially create a database of all of these things and then look not only at current potential UAPs, but they're looking back as far as, as about 80 years, back to the 1940s, to see if they can establish any kind of a historical precedent, precedent for any kind of a UAP program within the U.S. government. Show. So a reminder, the Pentagon has what's called the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, and that office reported in October yeah. they've received more than 800 total reports of unidentified phenomena. What have we learned so far? Yeah, it's the, we've, we've learned once again that the Pentagon finds something like UFOs and finds a really confusing name for the office, right, <laughs> so that we have to call it an acronym. But in this case, um, we've learned, frankly, in, in two words, very little about what any of those unidentified phenomena were. We do know that the U.S. is looking into them. They're trying to verify every single claim. I know, according to officials, that many of them, candidly, just have not been verified. Uh, but they're not only looking to verify, but they're looking to declassify as much as they can. We may even get, in the coming weeks or months, more information about some of those historical programs that may have existed from people who claim that they were a part of them, Joe. And I want to say it again, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, yeah. the head of it, is preparing to release, quote, a lot of new material. What exactly can we expect going forward? Yeah, so if you go on this website, which is actually relatively new, and I should say, this is all congressionally mandated, right? So Congress started looking into this a couple of years ago. I mean, candidly led by the, the intelligence community, the, the Department of uh, DNI put out the first uh, report on this uh, almost three years ago now. And, and, and so there has been a real push in the U.S. government to try to figure out what some of these videos and these claims from people are uh, of really unexpl unexplained flying objects, videos, uh, first-hand accounts, Counts. The idea here, though, is now it's all going to live on this one database, and the hope is that they will start releasing more videos, some testimonials, historical documents that we may get a better sense. Now, I also should say, I don't think that people should hear or listen to this and say, well, we're going to start learning about alien life. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of these things that we have learned about have actually been weather balloons, um, strange phenomena dealing with light refracting off of various parts of the atmosphere. Uh, but the hope is that we will learn a little bit more about maybe some government programs, U.S. or others, um, and that might give us a sense of, of, of some of these other historical sightings, Joe. Whatever you call them, UFOs, UAPs, ET, it's fascinating yeah. stuff. All right, Courtney Kuby, thank you so much. Welcome back. Magnolia Bakery's famous desserts are getting an extra ingredient. The New York Bakery has partnered with edibles company Incredibles to launch THC-infused bars. They're available in banana pudding and red velvet cake flavors. will go on sale in Illinois, Nevada, and Massachusetts, priced from $18 to $30. According to one study, edibles now make up 12% of the multi-billion dollar cannabis market. That is going to do it for this hour of morning news now, but stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.